Hi everyone. Uh, today we are in Bellevue, Washington, and uh, I'm sitting with my good friend Michael Reichman. Uh, you all know Michael, and another very good friend and a special person in this industry, Brooks Jensen, of Lenswork fame. Um, Brooks is uh, sitting down with us, and we're going to have a conversation today. Uh, a continuation of a conversation Brooks and I had on Skype a month or so ago and we began a discussion about what's happening in the industry, the changes that are taking place in photography, the evolution of uh, analog to digital and some of us that have gone back to analog and we'll talk about that probably too. But uh, I said God, we gotta stop this and it would be great if we could do this on film because Michael and Brooks and I, uh, to use the word old timer, uh, might Speak be a stretch, <laughs> but we've been we've been doing this for quite a while. Um, I've been doing it in the 70s, 70s, and you probably have mm -hmm. too. And uh, we've we've kind of come through the evolution from you know film and developing and making prints of everything and not having the internet. And you know if you were going to be sharing, we would put envelope pictures in envelopes and mail them to people. Uh, to where we are today, and. Uh, specifically, you know, one of the things that we've been doing in Bellevue is looking at this uh, company called Mylio, and uh, you'll see more information about Mylio and what it does uh, in some of the articles and videos that we've done. But it's now to the point where our images are electrons, they're in devices, we don't hold prints anymore, and a lot of things have changed. So, you know, one of the things that uh, we were going to do is start from the beginning and come to where we are today, and we might have to pick this conversation up and continue it at another time, because it is quite fascinating, the history of where we are and the changes that have happened and the amount of photography and images that are being taken. Um, Brooks today brought some very interesting old-time magazines, I'm going to call them, but he's got an uh, issue of the Camera Craft magazine. This is from 1900. That's even older than you are. 1900. And so it's, it's amazing going through here. And Michael and I found a camera we want to buy for eleven dollars. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool. But you know, it's what's what the beauty of this is is the fact that uh, for a hundred and fifteen years at this point, photography has played a big part for a lot of people. Um, this is all about you know camera craft. It was an amateur photography magazine and. Uh, this is uh, the, the Aperture magazine from 1959. When it was a good magazine. Okay. Uh, but uh, the more I read through this, it's like we could basically change the pictures and, and put the words in the article of today and they would be relevant. Actually, a lot of the photographs they published back then would still be relevant today. That is fabulous photography. As Minor White, you know, was a pretty fair photographer himself and mm -hmm. edited that magazine back then. So let's, let's start a little bit and talk about our, our journeys in photography. Um, we briefly had a discussion about this earlier and I know I started for example with my first camera being an Argus C3, uh, brick I used to call it because it's what it looked like and then my first serious camera was a Mamiya Secor 500 DTL, a gift from my parents <laughs> that changed my life. <laughs> where did you begin? Well it isn't so much where I began which was a, a Bakelite box brownie when I was 10 years old, but uh, my university days, uh, which was during the uh, ban the bomb movement, this even predates the Vietnam War, uh, but we were against nuclear testing, and there were demonstrations, and I was living in Montreal, and uh, I was in love with photography, it had been since I was a child, uh, and I photographed uh, with a Pentax Spotmatic, uh, which was the first camera with built-in metering and um, I photographed peace demonstrations. And a mm. uh, producer from CBC Television saw me shooting at various demonstrations and said, can I have a look at some of your pictures? And we lo he looked at them and ended up doing a TV special using the stills. And so this is um, pre-Ken Burns. Mm. We actually made 16 by 20 prints, put them on an easel in the TV studios, uh, in the TV studio and had two cameras and did moves and pa pans and fades and dissolves on my still images live. Wow. Okay. Somebody changing out <laughs> yeah, the really. Like wow. a cue card or something? Yeah. And then that led to a gallery show mm -hmm. and it was one of the earliest uh, exclusively photography uh, gallery shows in Canada and this was in Montreal in 1964. I think it was. So those were my beginnings in photography, and uh, but it was a passion from when I was a child, and you know has been ever since. Hmm. How about you? 
Well, uh, you know, uh, listening to both of you talk about what your first camera was, maybe is an indication of how, uh, it, in some regards, our lives are a little different. Because although I do remember my first camera, that wasn't my attraction to photography. I took photography in high school because I had to learn how to photograph through a microscope because I was studying protozoa. And as a matter of fact, I once wrote an article, How Protozoa Led Me to Ansel Adams. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to write a book report because I, you know, I was taking a photography class. And they said, go to the library, find a book, and uh, write a book report. And I found a book of Wynne Bullock's mm, work, oh, a monograph. Yeah. And I said, this is what photography is? I knew nothing about cameras, but I knew I loved photographs. And once I was introduced to Wynne Bullock, then it wasn't too difficult of a transition to learn about Ansel Adams and Paul Strand and Minor White, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, the camera has always been just merely a secondary tool. It was really the photographs that I fell in love with. And I think that's probably why I produce lens work today, rather than a camera magazine like CameraCraft. No, your, I, your magazine has nothing about gear in it. Nothing about it's gear. It's all about images. Yeah. And uh, that, to me, is really what's changing is not the images themselves. The camera equipments are changing, but go back to your issue about what's changing is so much since the days of the Internet have changed how we share photographs, how we appreciate photographs, how we connect with an audience. And in particular, there's one thing that I think is one of the underlying things uh, that goes outside of the internet and outside of cameras that nobody ever talks about, and that's this. When someone of our generation went to uh, the library and got a book, we saw images like I did when Bullock and said, wow. But then when we went to the gallery, if we were lucky enough to have a gallery handy, we saw the original photographs and went, oh my god. We had that revelation of seeing what the real photograph was, okay? Fast forward to today, though, and I think today's photographers don't have that experience because the quality of printing has gotten so good in the last 50 years. You're talking about offset printing. Offset print, commercial printing, uh, has gotten so good that now the difference between a book mm -hmm. and a gallery print is so small that today's photographers don't have that experience at all. And so their relationship to the print, their relationship to the artifact, to collectability of photography, all of that has changed. Now you throw the internet and tablets on top, holy moly, it's just a different world. Well, but it, okay, please. I think there's also the, uh, using the word explosion is not hyperbole, uh, the explosion in the amount of photography that is being done. Yeah. People used to have the family camera, and I'm not talking about serious photographers, I'm talking about, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mom and dad, Mam moms and dads. And moms and dads had a family camera, maybe it was a good one, maybe not, but, and sometimes the film would stay in the camera between Christmas and Easter, mm -hmm. and then finally get used up, and then it'd get processed, and there were, there were all these uh, pictures which we now have in our shoe boxes, mm -hmm. you know, and, and family albums. Uh, and now that's changed with the ubiquity of, yeah. you know, the camera, the smartphone with a camera. Every I, I was just doing some research on this and saw uh, a statistic that there are two point eight billion photographs made every day. Yes, every, every day. day. There are more photographs made now every day than in the entire world history of photography up until the last few years. Every day. Yeah. yeah. So and, and let's not forget, and it's a cliche to say it, we are just simply inundated with images. You know, advertising, magazines, the, the net, um, television, movies, you know, we're, we're visually bombarded. And then there are all the websites now, uh, from Picasso to Flickr to, you know, all the rest of them, where everyone is sharing pictures of the hamburger that they had at lunch, uh, and maybe some more important stuff as well. Mm -hmm. um, and in the middle of all of that, guys like us and the people who are watching this are trying to do something that, just to put a name, but we'll call it fine art photography, personally expressive photography, mm -hmm. something that's more than a family snapshot. And we're trying to get our images seen and appreciated and establish an audience, and it's really hard. Getting above the noise level mm -hmm. is the hardest thing. 
But I think that's why I, I find it interesting sitting between both of you, because what we have here is Michael, who with 15 plus years of uh, you know, giving birth to the luminous landscape and uh, using the medium of the web and uh, the growth that, that has come with it, and yourself, who started publishing the magazine and adapted to the changes that came with technology. Now, I think in your story, you had the magazine, which then moved to a DVD publication, mm -hmm. and then eventually uh, basically a PDF or electronic version mm -hmm. of the, the magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I give you credit because you saw the change happening and you adapted yourself rather than say, I'm just going to hold out for print. And, you know, you understood that, you know, no matter what, the, the change is going to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to take advantage of it. I think it's cool. Maybe both of you could talk a little bit about, you know, as you saw this change, how it, it came to play in, in the business aspect of things. Because mm -hmm. it still is all about the photography. The mission hasn't changed. The audience has grown, it's shrunk, it's grown again, and it's changed too. More important than that, though, um, the audience has fragmented. My thinking about all of this really took a, a, a radical shift, believe it or not, from a book that was written in 1970 by Alvin Toffler. Remember him, the, the future shot guy? He wrote a book called The Third Wave in which he, he coined the phrase the demassification of society. What he meant by that was, Instead of there being one group called the audience, who, and they were homogeneous, they, they all watched the same TV shows in the 50s and the 60s, etc., they've broken and fractionalized into little tiny audiences. He called it the, the second wave and the third wave. The second wave was the massification. The third wave is now the demassification. So he was a futurist. It looked to me when I read that book uh, that he predicted it precisely and then came the internet which fractioned even further. I, I say that Ansel Adams was the last second wave photographer. He was on the cover of Time magazine. Everybody knows Ansel Adams. Mm -hmm. After that, instead of being an audience which a photographer or an artist or whoever could tap into, now there's a thousand, ten thousand, a million different audiences and you can have uh, high visibility with one audience, but it's going to be a small audience, and that has changed dramatically. So that now we have to identify who that audience is, that, that group of people that we want to attract, and go find them, and we may have a different audience for every body of work we do. It's well, a whole different way if of you thinking. Think, if you think back to what happened to the magazine industry, I guess it was in the 80s when we saw the death of life yeah. and look and the exactly. general interest magazine. Second wave magazines, mm -hmm. right. Whereas now, the magazine industry has lost some steam because of the internet, but you still walk into a, a magazine store, bookstore. Ah, wait. The magazine business has never been healthier. There are more magazines and more pages published now than ever before. It's just that they're all specialized. Mm -hmm. You can really see this in a, in a publication called Ulrich's Guide to Periodicals. It's kind of like books in print, mm -hmm. if you know that book. Yeah. Ulrich's Guide to Periodicals used to be this thick. Now it's like seven volumes. And there are so many magazines, and they're all, by the way, looking for content. When I first looked into this, I was shocked and amazed to find out that there is a magazine called Hanging Ceiling Tile Weekly. <laughs> Weekly. <laughs> what could you possibly say about Hanging Ceiling Tile every week? This guy has got to be desperate for content, right? And here we are as photographers, you know, providing content. I say in my workshops that you can get published about as often as you want if you're willing to go get published in a specialty magazine with a project that fits that audience. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It makes total sense and it constantly amazes me that although audience readership has shrunk, individual publications, whether it's um, uh, popular photography mm -hmm. and, or so forth, uh, their readership is down but yet they continue to exist and there is a proliferation. Now in the United States it's a little different. What's interesting where I live in Canada, we get on our newsstands a lot of British magazines mm -hmm. as well as uh, the American magazines. And there are only a couple of mainstream American mag photography magazines. 
there is a veritable plethora of British Brits, oh, magazines. There's even weeklies. There's Photography Weekly. Yeah, really? exactly. Yeah, and, uh, and it's quite remarkable. And if you look at the relative population size between Great Britain and the United States, I mean, it's a 10 to 1 you know, ratio or whatever the number is. Uh, it's pretty significant. Uh, and yet, there is a very strong, healthy market for photography well, publications. It's, it's interesting in our mm -hmm. travels, and uh, you know, we've talked about this. I look at certain cities when, when we travel, you know, London, Britain, the whole population is very much into photography. We visited Sydney and we couldn't believe the amount of interest in photography that was going on in Australia in the, in the Sydney market. Toronto, I think, is very active. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, New York City and, you know, there's a few other cities. But in America as a whole, we don't see that general interest. People are taking pictures, but there, are, there isn't that, that you know, I've got to buy that leaf filter system or this tripod or that because five magazines have articles about it and, you mm -hmm. know, this is the guy who says that you're supposed to have it. Uh, it's very interesting. I, I subscribe to all the European British magazines that are English, at least, mm -hmm. on my iPad through uh, uh, Vimeo, I think it is, mm -hmm. where you can get all the electronic publications. And it is quite interesting to see how and what they're pushing and, and you know, their interest. And specifically, what I really enjoy a lot about them is their design is so different than American design. It's actually cleaner and easier to read and you actually end up reading. You know? yeah. So let's, yeah. you know, maybe let's um, shift to a different track. Sure. And one of them is books, uh, mm -hmm. photography books. I know a lot of people ask me, how do I get my work published in a book? Uh, and the maybe. answer is, you won't. <laughs> it's virtually impossible. Uh, well, not not if you're <laughs> expecting some publisher with uh, you know uh, a bank account to come and say, "Hey, you, you, I've discovered you. You're a great photographer. The world needs to see you. I'll fund the whole thing." Those days are long, long, gone. long. long gone. Gone. I was holding out for something. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, uh, I visit bookstores and I look at the photography sections, and there's wonderful selection available. There are some great books, so some work, but it tends to be a small group of top name photographers who have already built reputations. It isn't that frequent for me to see a name that I don't recognize in a yeah. new photography. It's section. the same problem with the gallery world though. Imagine you're a gallery owner and you have a limited wall space to put inventory up and sell to people who walk in the door. Who, who do you want to put on the wall? Are you going to put some unknown photographer that no one's ever heard of that's not collectible? Or are you going to put someone who's famous and demands high prices? It's, it's very, very difficult for new photographers to break in. What I do it, when people ask me this, how do I get my work displayed, I say there are other venues. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, restaurants and bars mm -hmm. and, and places like that have walls and they want to hang art on their walls. And if you're willing to spend some money mm -hmm. and uh, print and mat and frame and then hang in a restaurant, you might be able to put up uh, anywhere from a half a dozen to a dozen images. Uh, and then these can be for sale and they expose you and they can expose you to a very interesting clientele. And I've had people tell me um, that this is, in some cases, given their career a boost because uh, somebody who is a collector or interested in the arts sees, sees work, you know, gone out for a dinner in a fancy restaurant, and they go, who is this person? As long as you know, there's information on how to contact you. Uh, so that's one venue. And then there are the art fairs. Um, they're, you know, from flea markets to, to art shows. Um, all kinds of venues are available. And let's not forget the web. And one of the interesting uh, things, which goes without saying, is on the web everyone can become a publisher. Mm -hmm. The issue is you're competing with 500 million other websites. Uh, quite literally, uh, not all photography, but some days it seems like there are 500 million photography websites, and how do you rise above the noise level? But that takes me back to the idea of finding the audience for that particular body of work. Yeah. The idea that we're going to find an audience for my work, that, that whole equation, I think, has dissolved in the age of the Internet. Now it's how do I find the audience for this work? Now, how do I find a different audience for this work? It's a different challenge, a bigger challenge in some regards, but we do have the internet, and there are ways to get out into the world that way, and it works well. But you're presuming that what we're seeing is that um, 
more and more electronic distribution. You know, the, that tactile feel of the, the publication or the, on the wall is, is changing. There, there's a, there's a, sh a huge shift that's happening, uh, and I think it all goes back to this business about the quality difference between the printed book and the, and the original print. And that is that, uh, that we, we no longer, as artists, differentiate our work between what we publish internet, tablet, whatever it may be, and, and our original work. So for people who want to do something that is not published and isn't on the tablet, then they have to start saying, okay, what do I do? And when you get right down to it, there's only three things that people appear to be doing these days. First is they go big. You know, you get a big Epson printer and you make big, you know, giant prints, which a book can't do, and that differentiates you. That takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of space, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the second thing they do is they get physical with their prints. So they start doing martial oils, or they start making objects, or they make, in my case, folios, or something, something that's a physical print that's more than a print in a mat board. And then there's the third thing, which is they become, um, shall I say, political. That is to say, photography becomes more like a way to communicate something that doesn't have anything to do with photography. And it could be political left, political right, all points on the compass, that, that's not what's critical. But what is interesting to me is how photography is becoming more and more about advocacy and uh, social relevancy than anything else, and that's the books. If you go look at those books that you're looking at, lots and lots and lots of them are that way, and it explains how they're getting published because a photographer finds someone who shares their point of view, whatever point of view that is on the political spectrum, they get funding for the book and the book gets published. The question is, does it get seen and does it get seen outside the audience of that small group? And that's one of the ch great challenges, I think, for all of photography is how do we address what we're producing, how we're producing it, and how we get it out. I actually watch you know, photographers that are very good photographers on workshops, for example. Um, you know, all they do, they photograph, and the most and the furthest they go with it is a Facebook mm -hmm. page. Mm -hmm. And that's, they stop right there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've got all these images, they've fine-tuned them and made beautiful images, but they don't know what to do with them after that. But and lots of people can do that these days, because the technology's yeah. gotten easier. Yeah. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I almost feel guilty now it's so easy to make a good photograph. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not quite Command P, but I mean, we're, not, we're not far. Well, in fact, uh, and we were talking about this before we started uh, taping. Uh, I've recently bought, for the first time in about a dozen years, uh, I'm using a film camera and I'm shooting film. And the reason is I developed a longing for the craft side mm -hmm. of photography. Exactly. Where uh, you load the film, every time you press a shutter it costs a dollar or more for 120 roll film. Uh, I'm developing the film in my kitchen sink. I no longer have a dark room. I haven't had a dark room in 14 years. Uh, but I can develop the film and I hang it up in the bathroom and then I cut it and I scan it and I work on it in Lightroom, Photoshop and I make my inkjet prints. But having and just one of the components that, that interests me about this, but having a re-engagement in the craft, uh, as well as uh, having an embodiment. The, the um, images now are ephemeral. Mm -hmm. They're electrons floating around on a hard drive or you know on a memory card. And to have a piece of film, which is in many ways an inferior, recording of the scene uh, compared to uh, almost the, the purity of a high resolution digital image. Uh, the fact that the quality is lower almost is something I like. Yeah. You know, there is... A <laughs> I just listening to the ISO 10 because I shot with 400 and it was too noisy. Oh yeah, it's I like, shot some ISO 400 like, film and I went, what? I used to accept this? I know, it's kind of <laughs> hard to believe. If those that are new to photography or a younger audience and so forth, I mean, we used to say, you know, 400 film, wow, it's so good now we can shoot it, you know, almost in the dark at 400. And we were out <laughs> shooting in the Columbia River Gorge the other day, and we were in some really low light levels, and I was shooting with my Pentax 645Z, Z, uh, and I noticed as I was working on the files uh, that I have some shots at ISO 6400. 
I blow them up on screen to full. There's no noise. Awesome. There's no grain. State of the art cameras can shoot at 6400 ISO. I need to shoot at least 100 ISO film on 100 ISO on film to get results that I find you sort of like acceptable. That, you know? <laughs> no, and that's why I'm dropping to ISO 25 and ISO 10 films, specially imported ADOX film from Germany, yeah. you know, with special, uh, you know, low grain developers. But you know what? It doesn't matter because it's all just about having a fun involvement. Yeah. This you is know, precisely why I've said this is the best time ever in the history of photography to be a photographer. Look at the choices we have. Oh, so Mind-boggling. The previous generations would be so jealous if they could <laughs> if they could step forward in time and well, have our choices. Well, it was hard to take pictures. I mean, you know, the cameras were challenging. The the cost was high. Uh, you know, when you look at film and processing costs, what they were like 74 cents a yeah. print sometimes just yeah. to even get a decent 4 by 6 you know, the, the, it wasn't something you could just easily pursue. Yeah. I think the, the advent of, of mobile photography and the ease of, of snapping anything and everything and sharing quickly uh, has, has changed radically. What I, what I worry about more than anything else, and um, recently with, with my mom, she hasn't been very well and we've had to move her into a, a smaller place, um, we discovered like uh, this Vivian, uh, Vivian Meyer. Meyer. Vivian mm -hmm. Meyer, and, and that's a great story, by the way. Watch the the movie and uh, stay in touch. Looking about, for Vivian Meyer. Just Watch absolutely it. an incredible journey to find that there's a photographer that took some of the most amazing pictures and never shared them with anybody, which is a whole other story until she dies. Now they're all over the place. But we we found a box, and I think one of the joys was was, you know, we, we went, it was my mom sitting in a care facility and trying to recover from uh, an injury that she had. And, you know, my kids, my brother and sister, you know, we're all in one place and we opened the box and we're looking at pictures of us and our parents when they were young mm -hmm. and the pictures of our children that they had shot, you know, as young grandchildren. And it was just like, wow, it was like a treasure trove. We have it, this stuff has been hidden. We didn't even know it existed. I know. Thank and, God I have all my archives on zip drives. Oh, uh, <laughs> this is, you know, it's in, in baggies, you know? So, but I think this is part of the beauty of photography. And one of the things that I really, really worry about as we move, you know, in, we, we talk all about the cool things that we're doing in photography, but what happens? You know, this is, um, rugged little C drive I have, you know, stacks of them with images on them and backed up RAID systems and, but, you know, that, that's all new stuff. What is, you know, it says, ah, oh, really, you know, five, ten years from now, what's going to happen? If yeah. ten years ago this wasn't here, I've heard this what argument, happens then? but there's another perspective that may be worth thinking about, and that's this, the 2.8 billion photographs that are being made every day now, only the very most important of those get to print. Right? If they get to print, yes. If they get to print. But th those are the ones that are going to survive because they're, they're pe there are still publications, there are still blurb books, there, there are still prints that people are making on the wall like we have here. So it's not that prints have disappeared. That's why, by the way, when you started this video, you said that photography has changed. Uh, one little tiny correction might be that it's changing. It's, it's a it's constant changing. process and it always has been. And I can just imagine three guys sitting around 100 years ago saying, you know, it's, <laughs> it's the end because albumin paper is being discontinued and they're bringing in this new stuff called gelatin silver and who knows how long it's going to last. Holy cow, they're gonna, we're going to have to give up roll film and go to 35 millimeter film. Yeah. Uh, what kind of quality can that have? Yeah, yeah. you can get a blistering and frilling if your uh, fixer is too strong. Yeah. See, and, and now what we now what we have to do is we have to, we have to define what fixer is for a whole bunch of people watching this. I just interviewed Clyde Butcher, the great Florida oh, photographer, wow, and you know he shoot most of his stuff on eight by ten film, and I and I was thinking of him out there in the swamps of Florida, and he goes, click ten bucks, click ten bucks, and you know we go out there with digital cameras now, it's the same thing still photography, but it's so different. Mm -hmm. And I think the question you're asking is, what's the implication for long-term history? And I'm not sure we know, because we're in the midst no, of it. No, but it's something I think, you know, in the past we never really worried about, because we put our, our negatives in glass scenes and notebooks and, you know, whatever binders, and we kept track of them. I still have those organized so that I could go back to the 60s and 70s with my stuff. 
but I'm really worried about the stuff that I've been shooting for the last 10 or 15 years and whether it'll be in, a, in a, some sort of findable way, what, what am I supposed mm -hmm. to do when I die? My kid's going to plug in every Lassie drive I have and sit around the, the living room floor like I just did with the box you of know, for my mom? You this know, um, this is maybe a more important thing than you even would guess, and I'll tell you why. I just wrote an article about this not long ago. One of the most common phone calls I'm getting these days is someone who calls up and says, Dear old mom and dad, who was passionate about photography and has left glassine negatives, boxes of prints, light impressions, blah, blah, blah. I have this huge archive. What am I going to do with it? How am I going to sell it? How am I going to monetize it? How am I going to get it into a university? And I think there is a tsunami of archives that are headed our way as the baby boomer generation, which we all are at one end or the mm -hmm. other, uh, go into the final ink maintenance tank. <laughs> you know, when we get through, oh, that's a phrase I have. <laughs> well, Ansel used to say when he went into the final wash. I've just updated it. Um, you know, what's going to happen with all that? Well, the first question is: Is anybody going to want it? And is anybody yeah, going to care? Will and maybe, care? maybe we need to let go of that to some degree and say what survives in publication in our prints and our, and from the ones that have been purchased and that are in museum collections. Those are the ones that count, and the rest well, of it. Ought to go to the landfill. What, what's interesting is if you watch the movie, I think it's called Searching for Vivian Meyer, mm -hmm. but in any event, there's a scene where this young fellow is at an auction house and there's this large cardboard carton full of uh, 120 uh, negatives in glassine envelopes. And he holds them up to the light. And, you know, yeah. and what he was doing, he wasn't looking for fine art images. He was looking for historical pictures from the 60s and 70s of Chicago. And this takes place in Chicago. And I forget what his interest was, whether he's an architecture guy or a historian. Mm -hmm. And he bought these boxes of Vivian Mayer's images. And then, as he started to look at them, and then started to develop the unprocessed film, and he realized that this was the work of a world-class documentary street photographer mm -hmm. oh. and of a caliber equal to that of anyone working in America in the 20th century. And it was only because this was, there was a physical embodiment. It was on film. If her work, if her 100,000 images had been on a drive, mm -hmm. no one would ever have seen it. That drive would end up in a True. landfill. True. And um, so I think there's a salutary lesson to be learned here. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if there is even is an answer. And do we really care about the two point whatever billion images a day that are taken? Uh, there are All some of them. Vivian but who Meyer's decides? story, this is a repeat because this is exactly what happened with Bernice Abbott uh, discovering all of Eugene Ache's, uh, you know, glass plates before they were going to get discarded. And we have Eugene Ache. Well, what we don't know is how many people as good as Eugene Ache are lost to history because there wasn't a Bernice Abbott for him. And you're saying that's going to happen with digital. And it's true. It's, there is a serendipity to this that, you know, we just can't control. So one of the issues I want to ask you about, Michael, is relative to digital work and it being lost is one thing, but it's also interesting how we now share work differently. What are your thoughts on that? There are all the things that can be said that are obvious about the web and about you know, websites and photo sharing sites. I'm doing something these days that's a little different. I'm Again, it's like my going back to shooting film. Um, I am trying to resurrect the, something along the lines of the Paris Salon, where artists would get together and they'd meet in, um, in a bar in Montmartre or in someone's salon and they would um, uh, bring their latest work uh, and they'd show it to each other and talk about it. And what I do now is uh, I meet once every two weeks. Uh, there's a small group of us and we meet at a different person's house. And we sit around and we talk about photography and we try and avoid talking gear. This is not about talking about my new lens or we're talking about our images. And I find it really invigorating 
to sit down with a small number, and this is only two, three, four people, a small number of people, and just share our thinking. Why did you shoot that? What was mm -hmm. on your mind? You know, you're speaking to my heart here yeah. because this goes back to this, this idea of who is our audience. So much of what I'm concerned about these days is the audience for photography is other photographers. Mm -hmm. Who oh. else shops in the photography section of the bookstore? Everyone's buying photography books. Yeah. So I, I, I'm doing a little different thing than you are uh, relative to a publication. I'm, I've started this new thing, or started earlier this year, uh, called Kokoro, which is Japanese for the, the heart of things, if you will. It's the, the mind heart. I publish a new PDF on my website every four days, and then at the end of the month, I gather all that month's PDFs and concatenate them as kind of a little PDF magazine of my work. But here's the key. Nothing in that is about photography. It uses photography to talk about life, to talk about well, issues true. of interest, etc. because I think that's one of the challenges mm -hmm. we photographers have today is to get outside of gear, outside of our own audience, outside of our own little circle because it's become a little inbred. But here, here's the thought that I have and that is let's not focus on size. Yeah. yeah. It's great if you have a website that has tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or even more viewers. That's wonderful. It's wonderful to have your work seen and to be shared. But I find it equally as exciting to sit with a couple of people and share and get feedback mm -hmm. and interact. And really, is there an advantage to having 10,000 people versus 10? I'm not sure. I think we need to ask ourselves that. Is this about ego or is this about being a creative person and simply wanting to share? I sometimes get as much pleasure sharing some images from a recent shoot just in a, a little binder with 10 prints that to me are the ones that are best from that shoot just with a friend or two. And then I put them away and they go on the shelf and I have to admit I feel as good about that as I do putting it on the website and having a million people see it in the next 30 days. Don't you pick up inspiration from others when you do that though? I mean that's one of the things that we've always shared and you know we will sit down and show the prints but it's like you know I like the way Michael cropped that one. That was a lot tighter. Yeah, what, the were way, th what were you thinking over you there? Know, and, and yeah. We have these silly discussions. It's like oh, yeah. you know I would never have put that guy in the left corner like that. <laughs> <laughs> You're pretty bad framing where you yeah. better check your autofocus and didn't quite get that guy in focus. But it's you know you are inspired to think differently and look through the viewfinder. I think Art Wolf does a great job of that. You know one of the things that he motivated me for and I've just been going back through all my images is you know finding the abstract. You know, we're finding patterns and repeatabilities and, you know, different things in, you know, your photography or the ability when you're actually taking a picture to isolate pieces and parts of a bigger subject to actually make it abstract. Like, I went to the baseball stadium and, you know, you got this giant stadium but shooting with a long lens with the seats and the patterns and the repeating patterns that they make. These are all inspired because I sat with somebody else and got inspired by watching their work, only to hear that the next time you know you get together with them, it says, you know, Raver, you're right about you know shooting and you know pushing the saturation, which is something I tend to do a lot. But I think you're right, Michael. It's it's sometimes not so big to, as big a group as much as the feedback you get. I mean, you just you know when it's one on one like you and me, or with you know, with Brooks, and you know at a workshop uh, when you do a print critique at a workshop. Amazing what people love, and people love to learn yeah, about their yeah. work from people that aren't even so-called peers as much as they are uh, well, appreciated. Well, we're photographers. We love talking shop. I mean, we can't not talk shop. But but I I learned a tremendous lesson a number of years ago. We had a, a very strange opportunity, but in a, in the lens work reproduction prints that we do, we had a platinum palladium original print of an image. Mm -hmm. We had a photogravure that we had made of that image as a reproduction print, and we had a gel silver version that we did with scanning it and doing it as a lens work special edition. And we put all three of them on display in the gallery, right next to each other, just for fun. My job during the opening night was to stand in front of these three and explain them. Photographers would come up and say, oh, fabulous platinum palladium print. What is this one with the line? That's a photogravure. I had to explain what that was. Oh, and this gel and silver, fabulous. But civilians, 
non-photographers, <laughs> would come up and say, why do you have three of the exact same image on the wall? And I'd say, but they're not exactly the same. And they'd look at them and say, well, they, they look exactly the same. I'd say, this is, this is platinum palladium. This is photogravure. And I'd explain and show and, you know, the platinum paint. And they'd go, oh, well, they are different, this, aren't they? This comes and back to what Michael said, the craft. The cr we as photographers can see things that other people can't. And in some regards, that's why I think other photographers so naturally become our audience, because they can see the subtleties that we put in. But we still have a certain obligation, I think, to try to reach out to a broader yeah. audience somehow. And th that's, that's a real challenge well, in today's I think the world. audience, you know, kind of as we wind this down, the, the audience is much broader now as we state by the billions of pictures taken each day. Yeah. What I think is really unique, and it comes sort of back to what you say, we've never been in a better time with our photography period, oh, is that there's now so much appreciation for photography. You know, yeah, the woman with her iPhone shooting all these pictures all of a sudden has more appreciation for a photograph than they had previously. And it begins to elevate up, maybe in small steps of, you know, seeing the picture on the coffee house wall or the next exhibit at the, the museum where photography is now beginning to be a more accepted medium. Many museums even have wings for their photographic collections. Um, you know, I see a change. I still see it and I still appreciate the print and in the end, you know, when we sit around in the circles and other things, it's, yeah, it's fun to show the iPad and stuff, but really there's nothing like holding that picture and being able to feel the surface of that print and, you know, kind of wiggle it back and forth to see the way it sheens and shines. Wouldn't and you love to come back a hundred years from now and see where all this has led. Or not. Uh, or not. Well, I'm just hoping my kids can figure out a way to make some money from my drawer photographs. That's the only thing they got. <laughs> Dear boys, <laughs> you have the filing cabinet. Anyway, we're going to pick this back up. This has been a lot of fun. I um, hope you've enjoyed uh, uh, viewing this with us. And we're going to have more conversations like this in the future. And Michael, thanks for being here. Brooks, thanks for making a special appearance and uh, sharing the, the books with us. By the way, if you haven't had a chance, take a look at Brooks' site, uh, Lenswork, um, some marvelous publications and a, a whole variety of other things, plus inspirational podcasts that you have, which I enjoy thoroughly. Thanks. I've downloaded the, the batches of them and they just kind of play in sequence. And it's just fun because you do see things and you do have a way of, you know, getting you to think differently. But uh, anyway, thanks for joining us and uh, we'll see you again on the Luminous Landscape.